to our uh, next session, Circularity, Game Changes for a Prosperous, Inclusive and Equitable Society. This um, uh, Game Changes, we're talking about uh, understanding how uh, the circular transition will have effects uh, in all directions and on various people. Over the next hour, we'll try to better understand the socio-economic dynamics of circularity beyond the labour market effects of the transition. We will try to use this understanding to make better decisions and take advantage of the social and economic benefits of circularity in addition to the environmental benefits. the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States, uh, Mr. Michael Regan. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all today. It's such an honor to participate in today's forum. You know, a circular economy represents an important change in how our society thinks about the use of natural resources and environmental protection using materials in the most productive way with an emphasis on using less, reducing toxic chemicals and their environmental impacts throughout the material life cycle and ensuring that we have sufficient resources to meet our needs today and those of future generations. But we must also consider how these changes and decisions impact historically underserved and pollution burdened communities. International events such as the World Circular Economy Forum help raise awareness about circularity and promote further national and international action. We can learn a considerable amount from each other and identify best practices that can achieve lasting results. Over the next three days, this forum will feature sessions to share information, experiences, and successes related to promoting a circular global economy. It will specifically ask how we can transform existing systems to scale up a global circular economy that is prosperous, inclusive, and equitable. The task before us, how to ensure that this transition to a circular economy within and across our countries meaningfully involves all people and that all communities, especially the under and underserved and pollution burden, share in the public health and environmental benefits that this transformation will deliver. In the United States, we are, laser focused. we are laser focused on ensuring that all people realize the full protections of our environmental laws and policies. When President Biden took office, he pledged to prioritize what we refer to in the United States as environmental justice. And at EPA, we believe that it's our obligation to empower historically underserved communities who've long borne the burden of pollution and suffered disproportionately from the impacts of climate change and unsustainable materials management. That's why EPA is working to incorporate environmental justice into every aspect of our work, including rethinking our regulatory permitting and enforcement activities to ensure that every community is protected from environmental hazard and harm. Investing in communities to make them cleaner, healthier, stronger, and more economically competitive is one of our most important objectives at EPA. So I'm pleased to share that EPA plans to release our national recycling strategy later this fall. The strategy highlights the actions needed from governments, industry, and others to transform our recycling system. While this strategy focuses on municipal solid waste recycling, we are broadening our vision to help the nation address the full impacts of materials on all of our communities. Recycling alone is simply not enough. We need a transformative vision for our waste management system one that is inclusive, more equitable, and reflects the urgency of the climate crisis. That's why we see the National Recycling Strategy as the first part of a series of strategies on building a circular economy for everyone. We know from eminent scientists on the International Resource Panel that natural resource extraction and processing 
make up about half of all global greenhouse gas emissions. In 2019, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation reported that applying circular economy strategies in five key materials, including cement, aluminum, steel, plastics, and food, can achieve reductions in greenhouse gas emissions equal to cutting current emissions from all global transport to zero. EPA recognizes that we must be more innovative in how we design and use materials in the United States and all around the world. We also recognize the burden that living near resource extraction, mining, waste, and waste-related facilities can have on communities when the pollutants from these operations are not properly managed. Underserved communities continue to be disproportionately impacted by higher pollution levels, as well as resulting adverse health and environmental impacts. Sustainability by its definition requires social equity. It is critical that we implement circular economy strategies that are inclusive of all communities with environmental justice concerns and pursue innovations that offer all people the benefits of cleaner processing and materials. The national recycling strategy is a critical part of achieving this improved vision for how we manage materials more sustainably and equitably here in the United States. And EPA is also developing a new goal to reduce the climate impacts from the production, consumption, use, and disposal of materials more broadly. This vision for how we use materials begins with the designing products phase to be sustainable, reducing the creation of waste with local communities in mind, maximizing reuse and recycling, and minimizing the impacts of waste management at end of life. We need to strengthen our efforts to reduce, reuse, and recover materials and products such as plastics, electronics, food, cement, and concrete. And as we continue to build a circular economy for all, we will develop subsequent strategies to identify the key actions needed to reduce the impacts of these materials. While the United States is a major materials user, we know we cannot achieve progress alone. The challenges we face from climate change to environmental justice to marine litter require global collaboration. So we look forward to working with you as part of the global community of leaders to help build the information, capacity, and innovation that is needed to build a circular economy for all. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much, Minister. Thank you very much. Minister Vegan. It, Vegan, it is a pleasure to meet you. It's a pleasure to be sharing space with you uh, today. I, actually I, I to believe you're on mute. <laughs> Oh, am I on mute? Can we hear me? Just checking with our tech team. Are we good? Okay, perfect. We are good. Pleasure to meet you, Administrator Regan. Okay. Well, there are a couple of technical difficulties happening on the other end, but that is no worries. I'm gonna use this moment to actually read out the definition of environmental justice according to the EPA on their website. So according to the EPA, environmental justice is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respect to the development and implementation and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. And so this is a really important topic to chat about because as we talk about the environment, as we talk about transitions into circular economy, we need to recognize that most of our societies across the world are structured in inherently unjust and unfair ways. And thereby, this, in trying to transform these systems, if we don't take into consideration these injustices, we then not fix them, thereby inhibiting people from truly benefiting from these changes. And so, let me just quickly clarify the tech team. Can, uh, can Mr. Regan hear me? Perfect. So, um, and Mr. Torregan, uh, my first question for you is sort of given the importance of environmental justice and given that we are in a uh, forum where we're talking about the circular economy, where we're talking about things that are inherently environmental, um, for people who haven't heard about environmental justice before, for people who haven't used it uh, before, where does environmental justice fit in an event about a future circular transition? Well, thank you, it's an excellent question. And a future circular transition, it impacts the way society thinks holistically about the use of natural resources and environmental protection. 
So this conversation not only requires all of society be at the table, mm -hmm. but also requires careful consideration to ensure this transition addresses and doesn't add to the disproportionate pollution burden that vulnerable and underserved communities face. These communities already bear the highest burden of pollution and face the greatest risk and impacts from unsustainable management, materials management. So we must prioritize their well-being in this transition. Mm -hmm. Any future transition presents challenges and opportunities. And in this transition, it is the circular that we implement, it is critical that we implement circular economy strategies that are inclusive of all communities with environmental justice concerns and pursue innovations that offer all people the benefits of cleaner processing, including the reuse, recycle, and proper disposal of materials. Amazing. And I think something that's really um, important to highlight right now for all of our international audiences is while well, when we talk about environmental justice in the North American context, in particular in the U.S., in particular in Canada, we tend to talk about it from a racial perspective in recognizing that um, people of certain races tend to be closer to, um, to sites of pollution, closer to natural resource extraction, closer to um, circumstances that actually render their surrounding environment toxic uh, to them and harmful to them. But in every single nation in, this, in the world we currently live in, there are inequalities that are integrated into systems and into the environment. And so I ask that each person that's sort of listening to this that's coming from the various countries that you're coming from to sort of really sit down and think, which are the groups in your nation whose voices are not heard, whose voices are underserved, whose voices are underrepresented, and think about the environments that they live in. Who does not hold political power in the nations that you're in? Which groups need additional recognition in the fight for a circular economy, in the fight for the environment. And so, uh, Administrator Reagan, to follow up to that last question, how can people integrate environmental justice into their daily lives and into their work? Well, you know, you gave a, a really good definition of environmental justice early on, and that this goal will be achieved when everyone is in a position to enjoy uh, a few things. Scroll up. Uh, and the same degree of protection from environmental and health hazards, equal access to the decision-making process to have a healthy environment mm -hmm. in which to live, learn, work, and pray. Mm -hmm. Delivering progress on environmental justice can't be achieved by any one person or entity, but it must be our shared mission. And it starts with engaging with and, in, and listening to all of our underserved and overburdened communities, those who have not had uh, a seat traditionally at the table, mm -hmm. protecting vulnerable and underserved communities and increasing everyone's access to those of us who are making decisions uh, is at the core of my vision for EPA and for all of our international partnerships. So to realize that vision, uh, some strategies we are using include looking at our own operations internally mm -hmm. to integrate the principles of environmental justice into all of our programs, policies and activities, mm -hmm. including setting agency-wide level goals and measuring how we advance environmental justice, mm -hmm. making early and meaningful engagement with all of our underserved communities, mm -hmm. which means actually visiting them on the ground, listening to their needs mm -hmm. and learning from them about their preferred set of solutions, mm -hmm. working to identify the priority issues of concern to these vulnerable and underserved communities and then working collaboratively with them to address the key issues and some of the underlying issues. Mm -hmm. The policies, the systems, the structures, all of these things that have resulted in these communities uh, being most vulnerable, most impacted, most polluted, and quite frankly, most at risk of environmental and public health impacts. So using data and innovative mapping and other visualization tools will also help us advance environmental justice by identifying the right overburden, vulnerable and underserved communities mm -hmm. and taking necessary actions to provide tangible mm -hmm. and meaningful improvements in their environment, public health economies and other quality of life needs. Ultimately, we're making environmental justice at EPA a top priority, but it takes more than EPA. As the president has rightfully pointed out, it takes a whole of government and society effort from our federal government to our states, cities, counties, tribes, academia, the business 
community, our faith leaders, you know, everyone working together. So I'm really happy to say that taking uh, an approach that really embraces all of us uh, is really empowering. And we're excited to partner with all of our stakeholders to create communities so that they can be safe, well protected, healthy, happy, and prosperous. That's fantastic. And that really ties in with certain themes that we've been hearing recurring throughout the speakers all throughout today. We heard from Dakota and Erin really highlighting the importance of listening to community, centering community, understanding that the communities know the environments that they're in. They have that relationship with their environments and they're able to have those um, they have the knowledge and so it's a yes. question of providing that support providing the resources and as you said uh administrator regan it's not just up to the government right it's up to every single sort of large sector of society we're looking at the private sector we're looking at the public sector we're looking at um uh ngos we're looking at community members we're looking at grassroots we're looking at top down so really sort of ensuring that justice and the idea of really making sure that the table is welcoming to every single person and uh, group um, that is impacted by a circular economy. And so I challenge everyone listening today to really make sure that when you are having conversations, whether you are an NGO attending this, whether you are a government representative, whether you are a private sector person, whether you're an individual who's hoping to sort of get into circular economy, really make sure that every conversation you have, no matter which country you're in, has a table full of diverse people, people from urban and rural backgrounds, people of various uh, nationalities, creeds, race, tribe, depending on which country you're in and the way in which people are categorized in your country. Because while social constructs of identity are indeed social constructs, they have very real consequences. Thank you so much, Administrator Reagan. I will now be uh, handing it back to Catherine in our main desk. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Regan, and thank you so much to Chuk. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Carol Ann Hilton, someone uh, whose work I really deeply admire and have followed for some time. She is the CEO and founder of the Indigenomics Institute and the Global Center of Indigenomics. Carol Ann has led, to, led the establishment of a line of thought called Hashtag Indigenomics. This is a movement that focuses on the rebuilding and strengthening of Indigenous economies. She's going to give a keynote address today. We're fortunate to have her. Circular Economy from an Indigenous Worldview. Classish Caroline Hilton Heshwayak Supsish U class Wakatush Koatsa Umti. My name is Caroline Hilton. I am new channel from the west coast of Vancouver Island in British Columbia, Canada. I come from the New Channel Nation, and my new channel name is Wakatush, which means big sister. It is a great pleasure to join you today and to be able to speak to the concept from out of the linear towards the circular, an indigenomics perspective of the emerging circular economy. We have come from the age of industrialization and we are still responding to this. We are still being able to understand what this effect has been on our long term thinking of what has got us to today. What we are dealing with today is our ability to situate what does our next long term thinking look like. We have been told and assumed that everything about economics is true and is exactly as it has been told. The story of productivity, the story of growth, the story of resources, um, all of these aspects shape a narrative of the fundamentals of economy, of what we have known it to be and to become of what we experience it today. The realization that the world is seeking a new truth of what economy is and what economy can be. It is essential in this emerging circular economy to situate our leadership, our perspective, and have the space to be able to deconstruct our beliefs, our values, and our actions in the emerging circular economy, and how the structure of the circular economy itself relates to the ever emerging truths of our time. As we face a world increasing in temperature, as we face crises of humanity as never been seen before, the structure, assumptions, values, and beliefs of the circular economy must be addressed. 
I introduced earlier this concept of the response to industrialization. I introduced this idea of the effect of linear thinking of what we have known it across generations through the European industrialization itself, shaping the essence and structure of economy. To look at the facets of efficiency, productivity, speed, um, cheapness, materiality, all of these aspects have brought us to business models that no longer serve humanity itself. The realization of the central tenets of circular economy, we come to the question, can this structure of circular economy serve humanity itself? Undertaking this concept from out of linear thinking towards circular thinking, it is essential to be able to understand and decipher when we look at the four core principles of the concept of circular economy to ask the question, what are the opportunities in this? When we understand the essence of deficit economies, I introduce the concept of indigenomics itself. It is essential to examine the systems of exclusion of colonization, industrialization, and capitalization on the effects of the indigenous worldview and reality. To understand the devaluation of indigenous worldview is largely an effect of what we are seeing as the crises of our time. To be able to bring into visibility these ideas of reconciliation, of reciprocity, of respect, mutuality, and relationship as the essence and fundamental components of what is possible within the circular economy itself. It is time to begin to question everything that we have been told of what ec economics is and to be able to bring that into light of what assumptions we are bringing to what is the circular economy and what the circular economy needs to be. It's time to deconstruct our beliefs, to be able to address our values, and that this is really the opportunity to see the circular economy, its structures and central tenants, essentially as a chance to return to humanity itself. Indigenomics presents a series of prime directives to look at returning humanity and economics as aligned within our future to uphold this concept of dignity, to uphold systems and structures of design of resilience itself that includes indigenous worldviews and knowledge systems, to be able to extend our concepts of impact and to be able to look at responsibility as a central driver of what can be the structure of circular economy. And finally, to see intergenerational wealth creation as an outcome of the circular economy itself. We need to move beyond the simplicity of supply and demand, of value creation within the supply chain, of efficiency of resources, and to be able to extend this to humanity and the functions of economy and our relationship to the concept of economics itself. It is time to deconstruct all that we know and look at the emerging circular economy as the opportunity to move out of the linear thinking and move towards circular that includes Indigenous worldview. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to our panel on uh, Circular 360. Uh, my name is Michael Skelgen, and I will be your moderator. I am the manager of solid waste policy and planning for the City of Toronto and uh, Canada, and my team works on a number of initiatives that focus on fostering a culture of waste reduction and a circular approach to local resources. Today, we're gonna be taking a 360 degree look at how local communities all around the world are being transformed to address the environmental issues they face at applying an intersectional lens to their work. Although the word intersectionality is a more recent term, for the context of our discussion today, it's best understood as a holistic approach to 
environmental issues that include the interconnections and intersections of all members of our society. We know that today the world is experiencing increasing inequality due to globalization. And as a result, intersectionality means that we don't want to look at solutions to environmental issues in isolation, but rather we need to look at how the green solutions equally achieve social outcomes and economic benefits that are shared by all. It's not that one nation in the global economy wins or loses depending on the rise and fall of their nation's economy, but rather people from different socioeconomic groups benefit or lose depending on what is happening in the global economy. So for the circular com community transition approach to truly benefit everyone, an intersectional lens requires decision makers, the people in positions of power and influence, to take into consideration how the social, economic and political identities of people in their communities inform a unique experience of policies, programs and services. With the contribution of these unique lived experiences and cultural knowledge of people and communities in decision making, it will not only make our policies, programs and services more effective in managing the Earth's capacity of natural resources, but as importantly, it will create more equity and empowerment amongst marginalized and vulnerable members of our society. To illustrate what I mean in Toronto, Canada, for example, uh, for the past three years, we We've used an intersectional approach in the development of our community reduce and reuse programs. To foster a culture of waste reduction, we funded repair hubs and sharing networks in neighborhoods with people living in poverty, newcomers and other marginalized groups. And these help people help to promote, for example, the redistribution of surplus harvest from people's backyards and the repairing of bicycles and clothing. Residents, Nonprofit organizations and government worked closely together to make decisions on the location of these programs in neighborhoods with a density of multi residential affordable housing. In addition, because of the contribution of people's lived experiences, we ensured that people would benefit economically through training, skill building, and workforce development opportunities. Let's turn to our panelists who have important stories to tell us about circular transitions and intersectionality in their, uh, in their communities. Joining us virtually from India is uh, Zinat Niazi, Vice President of Development Alternatives Group. From Nigeria, we have Dr. Ndidi Noliadozian, the Chair of the Circular Economy Innovation Partnership in Africa. And from uh, Guelph, Ontario, we have Barbara Schwarzentruber, the Executive Director of the Smart Cities Office. Uh, welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us today. I have a question here I want to pose first to all of you. What I would like to know is, what was the environmental issue or environmental injustice that your group identified in your community uh, that you needed to be addressed? And what was the main challenge uh, with respect to intersectionality? Uh, let's start with Guelph, closest to Toronto here. Uh, Barbara, what was happening in Guelph that you identified as an issue? Uh Thank you for, for inviting me to participate today. Well, the problem that our community chose to focus on was the food system. It's our strength uh, in terms of our local context. We're a mid-sized city and we've partnered with the County of Wellington who has rich agricultural farmland and economy. And we have a number of agri-food institutes and research centers. So it seemed like the right uh, task for us to focus on. But while it was our strength, Strength, it became pretty clear pretty fast that the food system is full of systemic inequities that really impact people, planet, communities, and prosperity. 17% uh, of folks in our community are food insecure and we're a relatively affluent area. Thinking more broadly, the food system is number one contributor biodiversity loss and number two to climate change and we also waste nearly 40 percent of the food doesn't make it to the plate so 
I, I really believe in many ways the food system reflects back to us the soul of our society, our culture, our identity, and most importantly, our values. So right now, what we're seeing reflected back uh, paints a pretty abysmal picture of the future. And it really comes down to the fact that food is just not properly valued. So neither are the people who are integral to getting the food to us from the farmers who produce the food to the truck drivers who deliver it to the cashiers of the supermarket. You've got this food system that's embedded in an economic system that does not value environment and people and is based on this paradox of overproduction and abundance on one hand and inequitable access on the other. So in our community, we had people working on this issue from a variety of perspectives and disciplines and sectors. And what we were able to do with the concept of the circular economy is bring people together kind of under one tent and one vision to create a vision of the future that is about creating a sustainable circular regional food system. And that's what's allowing us to take a more holistic approach. Definitely a lot for us to think about around food waste, uh, even our work in Toronto, avoidable and unavoidable food waste is a big issue. And Didi, what was happening in Lagos, Nigeria there for your group and what did you find? Well, we've heard from three previous speakers about the top five, including cement, plastic and foods, um, like we've just heard. What we looked at was plastics. Really? Um, so really what we are seeing in the world is 2 billion metric tons of waste, solid waste, of which Nigeria actually generates 32 million metric tons and of which plastics only constitutes a portion. So even though, and it's really important to mention this, that we are actually generating just 1.6% of the global figure of global waste and yet, it has constituted such a nuisance that we, when we speak about floods, sometimes the floods on our roads are actually floods of plastics because the plastics essentially emerge from all of the drain pipes where they shouldn't be. And you have cars wading their way through plastic as opposed to flooded water. What I thought was particularly interesting in the last um, paper on indigenomics, which I really like, is the talk about new truths. We're seeking for a new truth. But what's really, really important is actually also to lean on the old truths. So the truths that actually already exist intersectionally across um, indigenous cultures, where we are, ways of disposing of waste in the past. So one of the things that, for example, we have is um, the packaging of some of our foods. This is the intersectionality of food and waste. One of our favorite foods is called moi moi. And we used to wrap it very prettily and serve it in banana leaves. Now we wrap it in plastic, which generates health hazards and on the other hand also generates a huge amount of waste. So to some extent, going back to indigenous practices and best practices actually is helping us address some of these issues of waste. But in our case, it's really plastics. And then we are hearing more and more about plastics all the time along shorelines. And it's uh, sad to hear about the communities like at your own with flooding issues, seeing plastics in the streets. Um, Zinat, how, uh, what, what was happening in the Indian subcontinent there in your community? And, and fill us in on how, what that looked like as an environmental issue that you tackled. Yeah, I think uh, before, uh, before I, I jumped the challenge, maybe a couple of points on, on where one is coming from. We are uh, growing, a uh, rapidly growing uh, economy, becoming industrialized. We are also rapidly urbanizing, which means that we have a huge manufacturing uh, and services sector, which forms the large part of our economy, and housing, building, mining, you know, all of that, the industrial sectors, which produce a lot of environmental pollutants, uh, and of course, uh, have a whole, a whole lot of impact on the local ecological systems, whether it's the hydrological system, the biodiversity loss that we see, and which all then has cascading health impacts, issues of access to resources by the communities that were there, and, and many other what we call developmental 
collateral damages uh, to communities. Uh, and, and these are being addressed in the industrial space through increasing material and energy efficiencies, for example, in the brick sector or in the cement sector, or in recycling uh, uh, municipal wastes, plastics, etc. But the, but parallel to this is the second challenge, which is that of poverty. And uh, you know we are um, we are a poor country. COVID has pushed us back even further, and we see over 400 million of us. Uh, you know, still below the poverty line. So there is a huge necessity to increase consumption to respond to a better way of life. And so, you know, you need to have millions above the social flow, uh, so to say. So we are, we are, we are trying to balance that. And in and the core environmental issue of transitioning from this very uh, resource and carbon intensive production model to much greener circular model uh, is one on the one hand, but the critical social environmental justice issue here is is that not only should no we would like that nobody gets left behind in the access to the services basic needs and goods, but they are able to access the environment the uh, economic opportunities of a greener um, you know uh, a greener economy which the transition promises us to offer so it's it's not just about uh, about the balance but it's also about how do we get people who have never been on the economic table now on the economic table uh, in in that process and so this is a uh, this is a space where we are looking at uh, small yes. enterprises mm -hmm. which are a new business model altogether local enterprises that have cut that have cutting edge uh, science support, technology support to be green, but are able to retain the economic uh, benefits within the local communities, provide jobs locally, and therefore, you know, raise the, the quality of life generally. So, you know, we heard the previous speakers talk about, uh, uh, you know, what would be this new economy? I, and I think the new economy uh, will need to see new models of business uh, which are definitely more localized, much more decentralized in the way they are. Uh, so really, it is about the justice of of having them not 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 there on the table yet on the table and having them a stake in the in the transition. Yeah, very good. Thank you, Zina. It's good to hear a bit about your approach and the strategy that you have there in India to tackle that issue. And Didi, what approach have you taken in Lagos, Nigeria, to work with the uh, whole issue around plastics and the water pollution? Very critical. Um, well, what this speaks to is the fact that actually in addressing the question of environmental challenges, we cannot but and absolutely must look at social economic benefits of circularity. That's the reason why circular economy is just such an attractive concept for us, because it really creates an opportunity for job creation, enhancing household incomes. And one of the approaches we've taken is to tech enable what we're doing. So if you think about it from the African context, we've had three leapfrogs. We've had one where we moved from landlines, take the case of Nigeria, 400,000 landlines within a space of 10 years became over 100 million mobile phones. We totally leapfrogged that infrastructure. Second case also in terms of banking, we had such a large case of non-inclusion. We leapfrogged that with FinTech to have digital inclusion. Now we have an opportunity to really take blockchain and smart contracts and begin to incentivize certain aspects. So I'll take an example. One big problem we had was um, digital inclusion, financial inclusion, and ensuring that people have access. A lot of the retail products that reach the bottom of the pyramid or the white spaces, if you want to call them, end up littering those spaces with waste. One big solution was how do we ensure that we have a reverse logistics where we're collecting back and incentivizing or tokenizing the collection of that waste. So you're creating a whole host, millions of new jobs where you're saving people's lives by essentially turning around what would have become waste into wealth. Um, but three key objectives really. One of the things is we launched something called Circular Lagos, 
Lagos is the mega city um, of, for Nigeria, 15 million population, Africa's largest city. Nigeria is the most popular city and also the engine or powerhouse of Nigeria. And what we decided to do was to start with Lagos and create the Circular Lagos Initiative, which brings policymakers around the table to create one common standard for how we address waste and circularity. Circular Business Platform brings the businesses around the table. And lastly, we've got the Loop Lab where we're trying to attract early stage organizations to come up with innovative ideas that actually get funded, that actually gain access to capital. Because we, if we're not investing in circular business models, we're really just joking around. We have to invest, we have to address issues that are environmental challenges, but we have to see those as opportunities. And those opportunities must create jobs, they must improve social economic circumstances, especially of those who are marginalized. In our case, it's largely women and youth. Um, but we can't do that without business, um, um, public sector and civil society coming together. So that's really what we've done in our instance. Wonderful. We're hearing lots of great uh, ideas and solutions here on private sector, technology, uh, getting decision makers around the table. Barb, uh, how does that compare with what you've been doing in Guelph? Unmute. Uh, it compares uh, very well because I think really all three of us are thinking about this in a holistic way, albeit what and I think uh, what my colleagues are also doing is thinking about it in a very place based way and thinking about it from a system change perspective. And because of that being our approach over the past two years, we've started well over 50 projects that are underway intervening, testing interventions in various parts of the food system. And we have three broad interconnected goals because you can't do this um, in isolation. So first it's to increase access to healthy, nutritious food, to create that very important circular businesses and collaborations and to reduce, um, but also to find value from waste. So we have urban agriculture projects that bring newcomer women and children together to grow and share food from their home cultures. It really helps reduce isolation and create community. Our partners are developing social enterprise models that start to address some of the food insecurity issues like a pay what you choose grocery delivery service where those who can pay full price sub subsidize the cost for those who can't. And we brought together organizations in a collaborative design process and a participatory budgeting process to design more innovative interventions to address food insecurity. But um, as Nadi said, and um, it, it really is about businesses and social enterprise and how you support them in our case, give them the tools and support to not only reduce food loss and waste, but to upcycle those uh, waste streams into new products. So we launched a resource exchange marketplace where businesses can list their commercial waste flows and others can use those flows to create new products or services. We've launched an accelerator program to create more circular businesses that is supported by social impact funding. And we're about to launch a new program of work looking at whether we can aggregate demand and build voluntary carbon credit markets that support regenerative agriculture and food waste prevention. So our work is intended to test and learn and demonstrate the art of the possible and hopefully create a model that can be shared as we are today with other communities. Well, it's, it's wonderful to hear about all the social economic benefits from all of your approaches. So I'm gonna jump right to the last question here for all of you. Over the next two days, you know, we're going to be asking the same question over and over again about what are the game changers? How do we change the game? So I'm going to put the question to all three of you. Where should we focus our efforts in the next five years? Give me uh, one quick uh, key point there. Zinat, we'll start with you. I think I'm going to go back to Gandhi. And I'm going to say that in the, in the next five years, we must focus on localization. We must focus on decentralization of production and consumption systems. Uh, we have to ensure that there is ownership and stake of the global communities in these new businesses. And we have to match the uh, needs of the masses, not through mass production, 
but for production by the masses. And that's what Gandhi said, that it's not mass production, it's production by the masses. And it's a very different uh, perspective. Uh, but most, more importantly, or I'd say as importantly, is that we have to focus on the investment, like my, like Bob and he uh, said earlier. We have to focus on getting the investment, both in terms of science and technology, but also in terms of finance and financing down to the local green enterprise, because that. And we have to stop talking scale. I think I, this yeah. is something that we really, really have to get out of our mind. We are not talking big scale. We are talking millions of micro movements making a change. And I think that's where we have to focus in the next very five good, years. Very good, very good. And Barb, what do you have to say about that? Well, I, you know, I think we're all waking up to the fact that the current economic system, we've let it shape our culture, our way of life and our relationships and our values instead of the other way around. So I do see the discourse changing around the world and people are really looking for better pathways to the future. But more and more, I see this as a fundamentally massive cultural change process. And of course, there's a lot of work we have to do to figure out the technical pathways to move from a linear to a circular economy. But in the end, I agree, this has to be co-created in a very place-based social and cultural context with people. And we need the creativity of new voices, ones we haven't heard before who are super passionate about a better future for their children and for the community. So I really think it's about localized projects. I think we need to build the demand side of the equation on which a circular economy can be built. Wonderful. And let's go last for this comment to Ndidi. What's happening in Lagos that you, what are the lessons you have learned there and what advice can you give around what we need to be doing over the next five years? Well, I think, I think um, you know, just a, a cue to Barb here, given the pre-summit on food systems and one of the statements that was made there, I think my biggest advice is listen to Mama Africa. So if we're talking about having voices around the table, one of the things that should definitely happen is we should move from a G20 to a G21. That's a significant population that's not currently at the table. And when I gave the statistics at the beginning, I talked about you know a significant number of amount of solid waste um, specifically 2 billion metric tons. And I talked about 25 million that was on the African continent or Nigeria. So we're contributing 1.6%. But we found, and here again, I just keep saying, inspiration was, I went to the 2019 World Circular Economy Forum in Helsinki, and that was where my drive for making a change um, started. That's the reason why we have Circular Lagos. That's the reason why I'm working on the Circular Business Platform. That's the reason yes. why we have the Loop Lab. So if you have the African continent at the table as well, and that speaks for all of those whose voices are not heard within societies, across societies, intergenerationally, intersectorally, I think it's really, really time that we moved beyond thought and talk to action, to being inclusive, simply because the benefits therefrom are so much higher. And actually, the last point, what I've learned, and we've learned that during COVID, is that change happens so much faster than we think it can. And I think a few days ago, we celebrated blue skies. And if we think back, one of the things we marveled about during COVID were the skies were bluer because we all stayed at home. We gave less emissions. And so one of the things that really can change quickly is if we have collaborative, concerted action that involves all stakeholders, not just the few that have voices, but really all of them. Wonderful, thank you. And I wanted to say thank you to Barb, Zinat, and Ndidi for joining us uh, as panelists for this session on Game Changers. Let's circle back to see what you said. Uh, you know, we've got a lot here about collaboration, about hearing the voices of everyone in society to really rebuild and deal with environmental issues to ensure we have social and environmental outcomes. Uh, now I will hand things over to Esther Goodwin-Brown to kickstart the next conversation on transitions within companies and sectors. Esther leads the group growth and strategic direction of the Circular Jobs Initiative at Circular Economy. Uh, over to you, Esther. 
Thank you so much, Michael, and good evening, everyone from the Netherlands. Um, well, Stefan and Jocelyn, we've got a TAF act to follow, but we're going to dive straight in. Thank you so much in advance for being here and for your contributions, and of course, to everyone at home. So we've been asked by the session's organisers to look at what an inclusive and equitable circular economy transition could look like within companies and with the sectors. And so I both, I'm sure you'll both agree with me that this starts with putting people at the centre of how we think about the opportunities that the circular economy presents, as well as how to really make it a reality with communities and within businesses. So before we get started, I'd like to ask the audience to weigh in. So for our, our second uh, word cloud question, you'll see on the screen. And this question is, what's one bold step that companies can take to accelerate the transition to a circular economy? So for everyone at home, uh, please use one or two word answers. And Stefan and Jocelyn will get straight into things. So Stefan, welcome. Great to see you. Uh, you're the Managing Director of Environment and Energy Directorate at UNIDO, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization. So I'd love you to tell us from your perspective how the conceptualization of corporate circularity has changed over the years from when UNIDO first started working on the topic of resource efficiency and cleaner production in the 90s. Oh, thank you, Esther, and thank you for having me. If we went on a tour on memory lane, we would see UNIDO and actually our colleagues in UNEP programs since 1980s, which were driving towards cleaner production, the continuous application of an integrated preventive environmental strategy. And that was towards the processes, products, and services of industry. All this to increase overall efficiency and reduce risks to human and the environment. After Rio 1992 and the Agenda 21, this concept facilitated businesses' response to sustainable development. And UNIDO, together with our colleagues at UNEP, assisted countries to set up national cleaner production centers to provide cost-saving, environmentally friendly cleaner production services to the small and medium enterprises in particular. These centers are now 66 strong in 51 countries. So our move to green industrial development and a green economy advocacy, we added resource efficiency in 2007. Today's corporate circularity was built on this base. It is a business strategy that emphasizes profitability then comes, that comes hand in hand with socially and environmentally responsible behavior and is working along value chains. We are pleased to observe that current corporate circularity initiatives are increasingly going beyond their sustainability departments and actually beyond their own businesses. They work within their supply chains. They work on circular practices upstream, on materials and downstream, on distribution, on use, and they take steps to understand and optimize what happens to resources in the full product lifecycle. Businesses' risk assessment are gradually incorporating climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution of air, water, and soil, all issues which are positively addressed by circular economy. In this context, investing in genuine sustainability is critical for businesses and enterprises if we are to achieve a just transition to circular economy and to live in harmony with nature. It's clear that businesses cannot travel the circularity route alone. Consumers, in fact, the whole society has to commit to sustainable consumption patterns <clears throat> and create the demand in circular product markets. Government's role is to incentivize businesses and their populations for circularity, whether it's with carrots or with sticks. Now, maybe I can continue and talking to Esther you are a global expert in just circular economy transitions, working at Circle Economy. Drawing on your research, Esther, how can we couple high quality jobs with equitable access to them and prioritize education, training and meaningful employee engagement? Thanks, Stefan. Well, it's our view at Circle Economy that it's all about people and it's all about their skills. And so what we really need to be doing within companies, but also on uh, the industrial level is putting in place 
long-term plans and long-term skills pathways that help us to develop our people, can provide job uh, security as companies and industries adapt, but also acknowledge that you know people within a company, within a community or an industry are really going to be the driving forces of implementing any circular strategy. So we th see that you know companies and industries as a whole need to have foresight about the direction of travel that that we all need to be moving in. So if we say you know we're going to change our production processes or we're going to start sourcing secondary materials um, through new suppliers by year X, we need to work back and look at what parts of the company and industry need to adapt and when to make this happen. Then think about what kind of skills we'll need in, in the team within our industries uh, by year X in the short and the long term. And then also look at the current workforce. So understand really what is the current know-how, the drive, the expertise that we already have sitting within our companies and our communities that we can already use to galvanize the change that we need to make and really work from the foundation of skills that the workforce already has. And so, I mean, it's a very simple, but I think very overlooked um, solution is to consult with the people closest to the business. So working with the people in currently working in the workforce to understand, you know, what needs to change, what solutions could we go after, and, you know, what are the corresponding skills that they'll need, what do they need to develop. Um, and there's a great example from a documentary based on a aerospace factory from the UK in the 70s, where they turned to their workforce to say, okay, we need to transition our business. We want to develop socially useful products. How do we do this? What do we need to do? What are your ideas? And they came up with these incredible solutions. And this is, uh, you know, this is not a, a novel example and it's not a new idea. But I definitely think we need to be doing more of this on the, in the industry, but also the company level. And as you said, Stefan, really encouraging companies and businesses to look outside their direct workforce, uh, to work with their suppliers, their distributors and their communities to think about you know, what are the changes coming down the line and how we can embrace those changes to maximise these, these social impacts uh, that the, the keynote speaker introduced to us. So it's really about developing and creating security for the workforce, um, having more dialogue between companies uh, within alliances and developing these long-term skills pathways that we can use to chart the direction of travel and, and bring everyone along with us. Okay, and so we're just briefly gonna go and jump back in to see the results of the word cloud and the results that what the audience put forward for us. And it's great to see such a range of ideas for what the companies could be doing and how we can take action and think about what the similarities and differences are between what we think that communities can be doing and companies, but then also thinking as many of the speakers have entered to the role of governments as well. So over to you, Jocelyn. Uh, you describe yourself as a, a serial entrepreneur and you work closely with female entrepreneurs across Africa through your role the executive team member at the African Circular Economy Network, but also your role as a consultant yourself. I'd love to hear from you what advice you have for entrepreneurs across the world about how to use circularity to achieve social, environmental and economic goals. Uh, thank you very much, Esther, um, for giving me the floor. And uh, what I would like, I'll start by saying that there is a big misconception, a big misconception about what secular economy is. As many people just link secular economy to, to recycling and to waste management. So I would just first of all like to remind them that secular economy goes far beyond waste management and just um, simple recycling. So it cuts across um, societal, environmental, and economic challenges and it also cuts across all SDGs from SDG 1 to SDG 17. So and uh, it also helps to improve the 3P, the people, profit, planet across various business sector uh, like the construction sector, the agribusiness sector, packaging sector and the um, 
the waste management sector, and even the services and textile sectors. So every entrepreneur, no matter the sector in which you operate, whether product or services, you can always embed circular economy um, in your. So it is it is not very difficult to do because there are a lot of um, people offering consultancy services out there if you can't do it yourself you can get to them and, and there are also a lot of open source material online that can help um, entrepreneurs to embed circular economy into your processes and so it's all about um, having sustainable business model and circular economy is part of is part and parcel of sustainable business model. So you have to transition to move from a classic business model to a sustainable business model that embeds circular economy through business model innovation. And business model innovation is an exercise that will help you see at what um, segment of your business you can embed um, circular economy practices so there are also some practices and processes that can commonly be used across all sectors like i said uh, for instance how you can maximize material and energy efficiency so no matter what you do you need energy you need material at the point of, or at, at that point in time so how can you maximize this how you can substitute with renewable and natural processes so and also how you can deliver functionality rather than ownership so these um, three main elements every entrepreneur across the world across all sectors can think about how they can embed it in their in their business model and there is a lot of uh, uh, a great development that can be done on this. So they can also check like um, the six R, reduce, recycle, reuse, remanufacture, refurbish, and everything that is at the center of sky, uh, transitioning from a classic business model to a sustainable business model. And it actually embeds circular economy. And circular economy, when you embed it in your process, it definitely will help you to have a sustainable business model and will make your business more attractive so uh, sustainability inclined investors and also will increase your portfolio of clients because today we have more and more people who are conscious about the planet and they want to they want to be related they want to be part of the story of businesses that embed sustainability thank you so um we are really really running out of time but i would just like to throw a quick one to all of us what is the role that our government uh, have to play in order for us to uh, succeed um, a corporate just transition so what do you all think and um, Esther and, and Stephen. Stephen, I'll let, let you take the floor. Thank you so much. And thank you, Jocelyn. Um, maybe some examples very quickly, because we are, as you said, almost running out of time. Um, I think there are there are a number of um, possibilities to facilitate that businesses and consumers actually are taking up circular economy ideas and principles. Um, one example is here where I'm living in the city of Vienna. Uh, for a number of products, the city offers um, to pay partially for their repairs, simply to facilitate that the products have a longer lifetime. They are not thrown away. They are used for an extended period of time. And everyone is happy afterwards. Um, the consumers, uh, of course, also the environment and also the repair shops actually who are working on this. So very simple um, first world example. Um, other examples are, for example, the, the work that we are seeing a lot on e-waste and Unido is very engaged in this topic. Um, whether it's in South America, whether it's in Africa, if I stay in Africa, Rwanda, for example, issued a national e-waste management policy and uh, the Rwanda Green Fund invested nearly one and a half million to establish a state-of-the-art e-waste 
Action Center and dismantling facility. And this processes 15,000 tons of e-waste per year and employs 300 people. Everyone wins because the e-waste generates income, pays for the processes. Before it was just a liability, the waste becomes an asset. Not that I want to, as uh, said before, focus predominantly on waste. I think it's a more, how should I say, mundane part of the circular economy. But it is a very easy first step. The, the value is lying there. Um, we in UNIDO try to help governments, for example, for our global consultations on circular economy that we had in May, um, where member states, our member states want to develop a common framework that's suitable for all to increase coherence, collaboration and partnership in circular economy actions. And together with uh, the European Union and UNEP, um, we launched the Global Alliance on Circular Economy and Resource Efficiency to advocate for a just transition to circular economy. Currently, 15 countries and the European Union are members of this initiative. The first high-level meeting of this initiative, GACERE, will take place as a, w, uh, as a World Circular Economy Forum site event tomorrow from 6 to 8 uh, Eastern Daylight Time, and everyone is invited. So I think I would like to give the floor to you, Esther. Thank you very much. Well, that's a lovely way to end with an invitation to everyone to join that event tomorrow. Um, I'm wishing you the best of luck with it. Thank you so much to you both for joining. And as ever, we've run out of time to talk about everything that we'd love to, to really hear about. But it's great to, to dive into what we think that corporates and businesses can be doing as well as entrepreneurs and then the role of governments in incentivizing and driving some of that change. And I'll hand back to the organizers and thank you again to our audience for taking part. <laughs>